Managing Director at ICTSD, uh, International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. Uh, and I'm really happy to welcome you here. Um, we're doing this session in collaboration with Next Trade. Um, and I'll tell you about Next Trade in a minute. My colleague Kathy Swominen, uh, who cannot be here with us, but she is here with us in spirit. And she was definitely with me in, in uh, collaborating to make the session happen. Uh, for those of you who don't know ICTSD, uh, we're a nonpartisan, independent think tank. Uh, we were instituted to advance sustainable development in the context of international trade and investment policy. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years. Uh, we re uh, work on a number of topics ranging from agriculture and food security, uh, IP and intellectual property, innovation, uh, climate change, uh, and of course, we work on the digital e-commerce space as well. We work at multiple levels, but we are in the policy space. So we'll go all the way from WTO, G20, uh, into regional, uh, regional integration agreements, and occasionally touching down into what's happening in the national space as it relates to uh, international negotiations. In this area of our work, uh, it's been going on since a, a process we call the E15 initiative uh, and our work following out of there, which has been uh, done largely in collaboration with the World Economic Forum, uh, has, has followed a couple of tracks, particularly the one here with the WEF. Uh, we've been working on uh, taking some of the policy options that came from the E15 process, uh, which was a, a, a couple years long process involving uh, hundreds of experts actually trying to find solutions for the future of the multilateral trade and investment system um, and understanding how those could work into current negotiations. Uh, and a second track that we're working on is a regional track uh, where we've been spending time uh, in uh, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, uh, looking at the digital e-commerce space more from that more from that national, national policy um, priority setting into regional policy making and then into the uh, larger instance of WTL where appropriate. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, so Kati's not here, so I'm, I'm, I'm forwarding a little message from her. Uh, and she's, she says she's thrilled that we have an exceptional panel, and we do. Uh, and uh, she's really happy that uh, you all are here. Um, Cathy's group is called Next Trade, and it, they help governments, multilateral development banks, international organizations, and Fortune 500 companies develop and optimize public policies and investment uh, for trade and digitization. Uh, Cathy has been the ideas woman behind, um, behind the E-Trade for All initiative, among others, uh, uh, the RTA Exchange, uh, and a number of other uh, very interesting initiatives. Uh, including with USAID, creator of a new e-commerce development survey and index that pioneers analyzing developing country business views on the policy and other challenges to e-commerce. So we've worked with Kati for quite a long time and it's been a, a very productive uh, collaboration. So today's, today's topic on SMEs and digital, if I can give you uh, just a little bit of background then we'll, we'll get rather quickly to, um, to our panel. But um, our original intention in this panel was to focus on SMEs, digital, and LDCs. Um, so you, some of you have mixed, mixed versions of the program. Um, so this, this has morphed a little bit as our panel came together. And so L, we're not excluding LDCs, but we're not, we're not focusing only on LDCs in this panel. So I apologize for, for uh, those of you who came specifically for the LDC aspect. Uh, but the, they, will, they will be here. But our idea was really to see what, what is the reality for SMEs and to bring a, a perspective of that reality um, here to Geneva policymakers uh, and, and to really get it from different perspectives. So and I'll, I'll give brief introductions to our panel in a minute, but to really look at, look at what that, that intersection between SMEs uh, e-commerce and digital economy and sustainable development is. So what's the potential for them? Uh, what kind of operating environment, enabling environment do they need? Um, what kinds of inclusive business models and how are they thinking of inclusion uh, when they develop their business models? And of course, we want to try and push that over to what can trade policy do? 
if anything, right? What, what, are the, what are those institutions supposed to do to support this kind of thing? So we want to examine from several different perspectives. Uh, we have uh, an interesting panel. So we have an entrepreneur. Uh, the, well, maybe there's more than one entrepreneur, but my, <laughs> my friend Rupa Ganguly, uh, who's the founder and CEO of InclusiveTrade.com and founder and director of Spina.org. You may have seen her stand upstairs. Uh, and she and colleagues had a very interesting panel yesterday, uh, which I would recommend to you. Um, we have an, a national a national policymaker, uh, which is uh, Constance. Uh, Constance comes from uh, sorry, Constance. Am I saying it right? She, she don't need the name, Okay, Constance. <laughs> Constance is fine, and uh, she's strategy and communications advisor in the Nigerian Ministry of Industry, Trade, and Investment. Uh, we have a multinational company operating outside its home market, and um, that's Aretha Frank, who is the senior public relations manager at Huawei Technologies, and a major platform provider based in China that has experienced incredible growth from, from being really an SME. I'm, I'm kind of shocked at how fast they've grown, being an SME to a major international company. That's Frank Pang, uh, who is vice president of Didi Chusi. Um, so, I'm really happy to have them here. Uh, you may also have noticed that Hannah Malin was on our program. Hannah had a family, uh, family issue and she had to leave this morning. So I'm sorry that she is not here and she sends her regrets. So let, let me move on. So our, our, first fo our first focus here on trade behind the headlines focused on, focused on SMEs. And, um, and what we really want to know is how they innovate, how they contribute to sustainable development. What are the constraints? What's the enabling environment? Um, what does it mean to do cross-border business? And what are those barriers? And then again, to take it back to what, it, what can we do for policy? Um, so the potential for new business models, many of which depend on e-commerce and digital, to generate new economic inclusion and hence advance global sustainable development is immense. But that's potential is immense. That's not a given. Um, and so the, so, Part of the part of the that we're under, thing that we're understanding as we go is really it's not a given. We need the right policy environment, and there are a lot of pieces. Some of them that work um, quite quite easily, and others that do not. Um, and we're having to do national level national level measures as well as international ones that work together. We're finding that particularly true in our regional dialogues, um, where for for. For many countries, they don't have, for example, consumer, uh, consumer privacy standards. Uh, we know that more than half of the uh, half of the of the of the, uh, the trade agreements that are out now have digital provisions. So that's a contrast. So there's a large number of agreements that have some kind of digital provisions. Uh, so it's it's quite widespread. So there's a lot of room for uh, a lot of room for. Uh, for development, let's say. So there's, uh, I think there's something that is w worth pointing out. Trade is not an end in itself, um, but the current state of dismal public support for trade reflects the perceived lack of benefits across broad swaths of our populations. And if the restructuring of business models through digital and e-commerce is inclusive, it has the potential, again, potential to shift the balance of public policy on the value of trade. Um, for broad swaths of the population. And it's not an end, of course, but if you look at things like, um, like eBay's data, and I'm sorry that, that Hannah wasn't here, you see that for those, for those SMEs, but largely SMEs, a lot of them, um, the, that they are trading and they're successful businesses, something like 80% of the, uh, and don't quote me on that, but it's a very high percentage of the businesses on eBay are doing some international trade. Uh, so so there, there are really tangible indications that if we set the frameworks right, we could get things right. On the other side, there are a lot of fears. Um, and so, um, so we here and in the, the events that have been hosted by the feds and others, are trying to identify, narrow down, what are the exact issues. So I hope this view um, coming from, uh, from our panelists will help us collectively understand what are the real business challenges. And then we're really fortunate because all of our panelists 
have have business experience and they all have policy experience as well. So um, I, I'm going to try and push them and you can help push them as well into so what does it mean for trade? That's the hard part. What does it mean for what we should do? So with that, I'm going to stop talking and pass the floor to Rupa, okay. if you would, please. And thank you. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, Andrew. Um, it's quite a pleasure to be on this panel because it was quite a surprise. And um, uh, we just had a panel yesterday and uh, it's, it's amazing to sort of take that discussion forward in a slightly different space. But, uh, you know, look at it from different angles. So my name is Rupa Ganguly and I come from India, um, although I have been living in various parts of the world, including Geneva, since 2002. So I don't know, probably makes me a global person. Um, my business model, essentially, I started off with um, really looking at the impact of trade agreements and working with small businesses to um, connect them to international markets. Uh, the space I work in is the textiles and fashion space. So that is the, the value chain that I basically work with. Within. And um, the course of all the work that I've done, we basically land up setting up Spinner Circle, which is a non-profit organization focused on women and um, artisans, actually, from across the world, uh, and working on a sort of a hub-and-spoke approach, um, trying to connect them to global markets while connecting them to each other as well. And um, about five years ago, we set this up as an online platform. Uh, where they were able to collaborate uh, within a sort of secure environment without it being completely public. So they were, you know, comfortable to put their profiles up and start working with each other. Um, going forward, fast forward five years um, to today, essentially the debate started last year actually at this same place at the public forum where, you know, there was this whole discussion about how could we take these wonderful stories and make them global and actually put money in their pockets. So essentially it's not just about promoting and saying all the good things, it's about doing real trade. And e-commerce, as you know, um, is really an enabler. Um, it's It's a... Of course, every new thing comes with, a with its challenges, but uh, e-commerce was, was something that was on the charts for a while for us, and it sort of propelled it uh, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So inclusive trade, um, essentially, our focus is in looking at how we can connect these SME markets, SME um, amazing businesses, to global markets and a mainstream business platform, while giving you as a consumer the ability to choose what you buy by impact. And I can talk about that a lot more later. But essentially, you as a consumer get to see the backstory while actually choosing a product and looking at the impact each product actually has. Cool. Good. Thank you. And, and what, what are the, you know, sort of what's their top priorities? And then we'll come back and, and talk a little bit more about uh, in depth about what they're doing in their and in their interactions with uh, cross-border trade. So, Constance, what's what's the top priority for you? Okay, so um, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very delighted to have been invited to speak. Um, so, I will be talking from a government perspective. Um, for us, as a country, I mean Nigeria. Um, I think the top priorities for us is to support the expansion of digital economy by deepening and not hampering it. And then the second one is provide access to spectrum sharing and efficient spectrum management, provision of ICT hardware, including fiber optic coverage and coverage through satellite. And the last one is capacity building and training in the use and access to ICT. Um, we as a government realize that these steps are key and vital for SMEs to thrive in our country. Of course, these priorities are informed by information that we gathered on the field uh, concerning the challenges faced by SMEs. Obviously, this, this does not solve all the problems that we have, but at least it provides a solid foundation for tackling the issues uh, in question. And I will say briefly that um, about 25 or 30 years ago, um, my, my father had sent me to Southeast Nigeria to boarding school. And I remember those days that everybody around you that you noticed was an SME. And uh, my grandmother from my paternal side, my grandmother from my maternal side, they were all involved in SMEs. And there was no technology whatsoever those, those days. There was no internet, there was no banking, there was no electricity, I mean, really nothing. And so SMEs were not recognized as a sector that contributed anything to the economy. But in a family setting, you could see 
that uh, most of them, which were women, contributed significantly to the, to the family and by extension the economy. And so the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm using this as an illustration is that fast forward now, today, the government sees SMEs as a, a priority sector. And therefore, at the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, it actually involves the three core pillars of, um, of our plan as a ministry. So we have digitization, we have the Nigeria Industrial Revolution Plan, and finally, we have supporting SMEs. And we're looking uh, very much at the problems they have, and they now have a seat at the table so that we can help them to go through these challenges. Thank you. Good, thank you. So the outlook, outlook is positive, yeah? Yes, it's very, very positive. Um, I mean, uh, Nigeria is a country of 170 million people. And uh, it is estimated by, by 2050 will be 400 million people. So this is an area that we are seeing that we can have huge potential for growth. So we're not taking it lightly. We are really, really working. Um, let me not say everything now, but we are really working hard as a government to make sure that we provide the platform, the framework, everything, everything that is needed to support this particular sector in contributing to it. Economy. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Aretha. Top priorities, top, um, top shot. Okay. Good yeah. afternoon. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. So, as um, Andrew rightly introduced, my name is Aretha Frank. I work with Huawei Technologies Company Nigeria Limited. I work as a senior PR manager for um, government and media affairs. So, um, I'll be speaking coming from um, a developing country, Nigeria, and also based on my experience working with Huawei Technologies Company, which started um, fairly recently as, a, as an SME and um, now works with a whole ecosystem and a large chain of supply chains. So um, speaking from Nigeria background, I'll say um, the top line priorities for us will be better and affordable access to um, fixed broadband and um, mobile telephony, as well as a predictable environment where we will have less heavily restricted policies and also enabling policies that will um, um, put, that, enabling policies that will um, allow for access to uh, online platforms and programs that will enhance digital literacy because it's one thing to have all these infrastructures in place and not be able to use them. So um, we believe such platforms will help the small medium entrepreneur to be able to bridge the gap between himself and um, the potential consumers. So I'll just stop right there. Great, thank you. Uh, Frank, what are your top, top priorities? Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is my back to Geneva after 10 years. You can check my background. Uh, I used to work in the Chinese in the Ministry of Commerce for 11 years to responsible for the free trade negotiation. And uh, after I come back to Geneva, I work as a private sector re representative. I feel, feel very honored to be here that uh, because I, the, so before I present my point, I want to know how many people here heard about DD. So if you heard about DD, please raise your hand. Okay. I want to tell you, so if you want to come to China, you must install three apps in your, in your smartphones. The first is Taobao, to collect people and, uh, to, to collect people and co commodity for shopping. The second is WeChat, to collect people and people for communication. The third is DD. The DD is to collect people and the vehicles for transportation. Uh, actually, five years ago, DD is, is one SMEs. We set up in uh, in 2012 uh, with the with the, uh, the starting fund only less than 150 million, uh, 150 thousand US dollars. But the current market valuation is more than 15, 50 billion US dollars. So I want to say DD is the fastest growing. SMEs in past five years, not only in China, but also in the world. Why? I think the top priority. In my, com in my company, we have many codes. The first code is to embrace the change. Embrace the change. Because we know that in past five years, 10 years, we can, 
witness a lot of fun, the fundamental changes in the industry, in the economy, in the business model, in, tech, in technology revolution. For SMEs, this provides unprecedented opportunities for them. If we can embrace the change to keep pace with the times, we can catch this. Uh, maybe somebody wants to say, we are not ready for this, but I want to highlight nobody, no country, no government, no SME can say he is well or fully prepared for the change. But if, the only thing we can do is to learn by doing. If you want to get fully prepared, you will never be prepared. So this is what we are doing for DD. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And it, it's, a, it's a good place to, to sort of do this first round because I think what we, what we want to pull out are the pluses and the minuses, right? We want, to, we want to understand what the potential is. We also want to know what the pitfalls are. So you're saying you can't wait until the perfect moment, but obviously there's some things that we want to have in place uh, or economies we want to have in place uh, as they move into this e-commerce, the digitization space. Um, so let me come back now to the to the panel, and I want to ask each of you from uh, from your particular perspective to take us through um, you know in in your case Rupa through the through the business model what you've been trying to achieve what's the role of sort of what's the role of e-commerce digitization and particularly inclusion how does how does inclusion fit into that model. And then if you can, and then if you can take us to the trade policy, no, you can, you can, as far as you can go, go ahead, take, you know, take five, ten minutes, take what you need, and, um, and then we'll, we'll keep okay. going, okay? Right, so, um, I have to be honest, I'm quite relatively um, new in the e-commerce space because our focus has been um, trade, essentially, and uh, e-commerce has actually come up quite as a demand-driven requirement in our business. So the whole factor, let me start from the sort of beginning, the model that you said. Now, the background, as I mentioned quite briefly, is Spinner, where you know we'd been working with a lot of artisans and women entrepreneurs in different parts of the world. Uh, we already had a lot of hubs in different areas. We had, um, we had connected these hubs on an online platform. We had also worked uh, quite uh, intensively with partners across the world in, in providing um, services to support um, you know, technical assistance and capacity building, if you like, to, to bring these small businesses onto the mainstream, or rather enable them to come up to the mainstream. What we hadn't done was actually help them sell, as in or sell for them. That was not something that was included in the existing model. As the demand grew, we had events, we had sort of uh, promotional activities, and as a result, the whole model moved from having pop-up activities in lots of different physical locations, which cost a lot of money and resources, as well as infrastructural requirements, um, we started thinking of how could we engage with customers in a way where we could be more efficient. So one of the key factors that came into play was the need for efficiency. Um, lowering costs in terms of the transactions and lowering the time that we were taking to have one event. Honestly, it takes a lot of time to get one event going. So, so given the fact that we had an online platform, we said, how can we you know, use that to now reach out to our audiences? Um, the model then had to shift because we did a lot of research, worked with a lot of experts, and figured that we would need to have a commercially viable, fully profit-oriented model to be an e-commerce, uh, to work in the e-commerce space, um, partly because of regulations, mm -hmm. again, and partly because um, the growth model gets hampered at some point if you're trying to get an NGO or a non-profit organization to start working in a, in a commercially viable manner. Now, I just want to make a point there. I know there's a lot of different um, um, models, such as B Corp, such as social enterprises, CIC. There's loads of different models where actually a, 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 a profit-oriented company can actually be doing commercial business. But again, some of the barriers there are all the requirements to get to that point. You've got a lot of paperwork, costs a lot of money, and takes a lot of time all of which we were trying to reduce. So the whole point was then it had to be a separate entity 
And so you were, you were going from like these pop-up events into, yeah. It's into e-commerce, yeah, right? Yeah. And the whole model then was about how do we do the same thing on e-commerce that we were doing physically? How can we replicate that and make it even better? So taking these amazing stories of this woman entrepreneur in Guatemala who, who works with recycled denim and creates um, amazing products using offcuts of denim jeans, working with uh, an Ethiopian painter, an artist, how do we bring these to you, for example, in Geneva. That was our challenge. And the platform thereby literally had to be a commercially viable platform while being able to communicate the stories to you in a way that you could actually read rather than it being just too complex to look at all of that and making it easy for you to actually make those payments, acquire that product while we could actually pay our suppliers. So that brought about a whole new discussion with mobile payment technology, blockchain, oh my goodness, a whole bunch of different elements, all of which can be slightly controversial when it comes to regulatory frameworks, as well as, um, you know, every, every country has a different sort of uh, national legislation as well around all of this. So as you can see, there's lots of different elements and tiers of challenges that you have when you're trying to operate, um, bringing sort of the SMEs and getting the trade literally from behind the headlines to the forefront. So inclusivetrade.com, uh, which actually will go live on 7th of October, is a platform which is now bringing these stories to you using e-commerce by actually conveying the messages and allowing you as a uh, consumer to be able to shop by impact. So you can actually see how and what these brands are doing, um, the impact they're having on their communities or their environment by being able to shop online. So e-commerce for us is an enabler. It's not an end in itself. It's an enabler. Mobile payment technology is an enabler. And that comes with its challenges because, again, mobile payment services are things that are quite country-driven. They're very national. So there isn't like a global solution. You've got to partner with a number of different entities globally to be able to supply or pay those suppliers in those different countries. And then finally, at the end of the day, you actually have to move goods from point A to point B. And with that comes a separate set of challenges, which include customs and logistics and warehousing and legislations around all of that as well. So I don't want to sort of take all the time to discuss that, but I'm really happy to engage in specific elements that you want to discuss, because there are specific issues with um, logistics. For instance, you know, the cost of uh, shipping a good from, let's say, country A to country B, the time it takes, because, you know, traditional models in the fashion and textiles industry work on lead times, right? <laughs> and I'm sure you've heard of things like seasons and trends, which means that we normally place an order about six months to one year in advance for products to be ready for, you know, being in store um, you know, a 12-month cycle. Now, when I'm doing B2C, it's actually 24 hours. So cut that whole 24 months or 12 months down to 24 hours. So models have to change and have to adapt to be able to, you know, adapt to the requirements and the consumer-driven um, market realities today. Thank you. And so how does, um, just in terms of how you interact with your suppliers and how, how, how do they become associated with you, how does that work? So we have, um, the way we've structured it is because the focus is on sustainability. The whole idea is about actually working on um, looking at sustainable um, brands and, and functioning in a way where um, everyone on the platform has a specific impact. So there are four different areas. So we actually engage with brands in a way where they, they actually fill out a certain set of requirements. And we look at, for example, social impact or environmental impact, gender inclusivity, and traditions and skills. So all the suppliers are actually, they, they, are, they fit at least one criteria. It could be all four. So essentially, there's a certain engagement where they, where they come on board only you know, by filling up certain types of forms. But one thing that we don't do, because there's a whole area of standards, <laughs> which I'm not getting into right now, but certifications and standards, either voluntary or, or non-voluntary, is a whole big area. And people could say, how do you determine quality and standards? Well, in a certain way, we're kind of leaving that decision to you as a consumer by giving you the information. So it's about giving you access to information, giving you the choice to make the decision by thinking about why you should be paying what you're paying. Thank you. And, um, and Hannah, Hannah is not here, but um, I'm going to raise a point that she would have raised in her presentation, um, which was based on a paper that she did for us. So um, her, one of her points was 
uh, coordination, lowering costs on transportation are really critical for, for businesses like yours. Uh, and, and that was something she's advocating in that paper. And, and we've heard it also in the uh, discussions here, uh, particularly in relation to de minimis, uh, but also in terms of transparency of, uh, of services. So let me, let me go to you, Constance. So you want to generate in Nigeria an ecosystem that's full and responsive and, you know, and really brings out the best of, of Nigerian innovation. So can you tell us a little bit more about, about what you're doing, about what kinds of challenges you're encountering, what kinds of fears from, you know, from opening up? So I, I leave it to you for a few minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, uh, for giving me the floor. I've just prepared a note um, surrounding a couple of the issues you raised. And I'll start by saying that there is a digital divide in the global economy. I mean, that's a fact. Um, um, but that in itself presents a huge opportunity. Um, data from UNCTAD show that high-income countries consistently rank top ahead of middle-income and low-income countries in connectivity. OECD countries consistently capture the top rankings, while Sub-Saharan Africa's average ranking is consistently low. Having said that, there's a spread of digital economy in Africa through mobile telephony, mobile banking platforms, innovation and uh, business hubs, tech startups and growth of e-commerce. Yet, the potential is still hampered by only 30% broadband coverage in a country like Nigeria with a population of 170 million, 30% broadband coverage. Our focus, therefore, is to create an environment that basically does the following things, supports economic growth, job creation and expanded employment opportunities, integration into supply uh, chains, both regionally and globally, solving development challenges through the use of technology and financial inclusion. As I said before, we're a country of 170 million people and will be 400 million by 2050. We are more than 50% of ECOWAS market and we're the largest economy in Africa today with a GDP of $510 billion. It is, um, this is a huge market that also pr presents tremendous challenges and we know that. We therefore see e-commerce and digital economy as a huge area that we can create jobs, apart from agriculture where we have competitive advantage. So our strategy as a government is to adopt a comprehensive policy based on the needs of the market. So we're currently de developing what we call uh, the Smart Nigeria Dig Digital Economy Project. And this project is supposed to find ways to facilitate broadband, facilitate e economic integration through value chains, attract and retain investment, and introduce local content to ICT and software development. So the strategy includes also working in partnership with uh, the private sector to, to achieve these objectives. I think that at this point, we're giving SMEs the attention they deserve that they never had. And I think it's very crucial because we recognize that um, this particular sector um, will contribute significantly uh, to the economy. So I'm going to use um, another illustration. Um, I wore this dress today. Let me stand up. It's not a fashion show, but... <laughs> So this dress was made by an SME um, in Lagos, Nigeria. And um, there are different categories of SMEs. There are those that have a formal education. There are those that don't have a formal education. So this is made by Zelda Concepts, a woman who studied political science. And um, she decided to turn her passion into a, a business uh, as persuaded by her friends. And even with the formal education, she's struggling. She has, um, <coughs> she has uh, seven employees, and um, she doesn't have a lot of financial literacy. She suffers from lack of formalization. She suffers from um, lack of skilled workers or skilled labor, and, and a couple of other things. And then when we talk about digitization or moving online, she's mortified by it because she, she's, she's afraid that she cannot ramp up production. So if you go online or, you know, and, and then you have these beautiful uh, clothes and people make um, uh, demands or people make order and you cannot meet the demand. So that challenges the, the integrity and consistency of your output. So these issues are some of the things faced by the SMEs and um, uh, some of the things that we work with them on and, you know, to solve uh, those problems. I can... Do I still have time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Please, please. Yeah. 
So another issue is um, um, how do we enable more trade, for instance, within the West Africa region uh, for SMEs. I think on the continent-wide level, we need to do the following. Create the necessary infrastructure, promote intra-African trade, launch a round of negotiations, and have a hegemon within the region become a champion for liberalization. As some of you may be aware, we are uh, currently um, negotiating the Continental Free Trade Agreement. That is among the whole of Africa. And I think that we're a bit delighted by this because what it means is that if the CFTA is successful, it sets the tone for uh, intra-African trade. And then when you, uh, you are able to make laws and create laws and uh, remove barriers, I think that SMEs benefit disproportionately from an environment that enables them to do business. So I think that we're, we're quite happy about that. And then at the multilateral level, I think that continuous engagement um, with the countries um, is very necessary to continue to understand the nature and shape of the existing problems. Then finally, um, steps that can be taken at all levels to, to generate positive growth. Um, in Nigeria, we have so many things that we're doing. We have a lot of programs currently tailored towards SMEs. So we have a bank of industry that gives uh, loans and grants to SMEs. We have uh, what we call the Growth and Employment Project, also provides grants. It's very competitive, so it's not just giving away money. You have to go into the competition, and you know, if you're able to win, you get some, some help. And then we have the Aso Villa Demo Day, which targets young entrepreneurs with innovative tech ideas. And then we have the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which provides education and support programs to create that mindset to accelerate growth. And then we have the micro, small, and medium enterprise clinics, which also creates a platform where enterprise challenges are identified and solutions are preferred. I mean, we have several programs. Um, they are not enough for the sheer size of our country. But the most important thing is that um, we've started working at it and we continue to engage uh, with the businesses to understand how we can continue to help them. Um, I thank you for listening. Thank you. So, so it sounds like in Nigeria, you're doing some of that supportive work at the national level. Um, so you're, you're not waiting until everything is perfect and you're seeing what's the CFTA as, a, as an opportunity. What, how do people feel about that? Uh, is there, you know, are there, is there still a, a fair amount of, I mean, is there fear about, well, what happens when we open up? Or are people getting confidence that, well, we're building the domestic side of our, our ability to do this. We're working on the broadband and so on. So we're going to be able to do it. Just a sense of that. The interesting thing in, in Nigeria is that um, the private sector, even without government intervention, intervention they are doing their thing. They, you know, they've moved on ahead of government, actually. So government is sort of coming on board to try to bring uh, into place regulations. They do have their concerns and worries about the CFTA. We get, you know, people asking questions. When we open up the market, will, will Nigeria not be a dumping ground for goods and things like that? But also the conversation goes in such a way that we, dis we, we, um, we sort of give the accurate information and continue to engage with businesses, uh, business associations. So for instance, the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria, we have all these associations that um, are surrounding different uh, sectors. Um, so we talk with them, we try to explain to them what it is. And you have to bring along uh, the people when you uh, decide to uh, make such uh, regulations and, and the laws. So um, I, I think that, um, like I said before, what we're doing might not be enough, at the moment, but you have people that are, have a positive um, sort of outlook that at least the government is listening. I'll give you an example. We have something that we just launched a couple of months ago called the Industrial Council. So in the Industrial Council is a way of working together with the private sector, coming together and asking them what is exactly that what, what is it that you exactly need? What kind of bankable projects can we work together on and um, deliver them? So it's, it's not going to be a talk shop or just rhetoric. You know, it's going to be practical cases of things on the ground that we can work on, whether it's an infrastructure, whether it's a transport system, whether it's a broadband, whatever it is, and let us begin to tailor them into projects and begin to execute them so that at the end of the day, you can see that you've made uh, some progress. Thank you. So, Aretha, um, so how does 
so now we're coming to a, the perspective of a, of a big company that's out of its home market and investing in, you know, in another market. How does, how does Huawei see that? How does, how does inclusion, digitization and inclusion work together in Huawei's business model? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, well, let me first start by saying that um, a digital strategy for every, for a developing country um, starts with a vision and political will at the highest level of government. So uh, it has to be an all government approach Basically, there needs to be a framework, meaning that um, it should not start. It should be a top priority for every ministry or, gov of, or government agency. Um, the role of prioritization should be taken seriously, starting from the office of the president, meaning the president should take the lead uh, in this. Um, so we can have an all government approach. I believe the, the major challenge we have in Nigeria is infrastructure related, meaning we have to lay more fiber optics, build more base stations, roll out more backhauls. And this requires a lot of investments and for investments to happen, we, the right initiative incentives need to be in place and um, the right investment climate as well. So um, these are some of the fundamental issues we, 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 we are trying to address. And um, we also have uh, digital literacy. I believe we cannot leave it all to the government. So for a company like Huawei, we try to uh, bridge digital literacy through um, initiatives like our Seed for the Future program um, and a whole, sort, a whole lot of robust CSR activities bordering around um, <coughs> digital literacy. It will interest you to know that um, recently, Huawei partnered with the federal government of Nigeria to train 2,000 um, graduates, actually, to empower them in ICT literacy. This is because we understand that we cannot leave it all to the government, so we tend to always partner with them. and. Um, we tr so far we have this initiative started last year and so far we have trained about 1,345 out of which 10 excellent, um, 10, 10, ex uh, 10 excellent beneficiaries have been tr taken to China for further training. Um, let me just share a short story. It will, one of these beneficiaries who lives in the northern part of Nigeria has actually started a trade on his own whereby fixing uh, phones in his little community in, um, in the northern part of Nigeria. So uh, these are some of the things we're doing with the government because we understand that we cannot leave it all up to the government to take care of. Uh, I actually have this book. It's our brochure for 2016. It just shows more ways in which we have partnered with the government because Huawei is ready to partner with any government in in uh, elaborating and implementing its uh, digital plans. So I'm glad to share this book with anyone. If you're interested, I have a few copies with me. And, and um, so, the, so the, the training component is, is essential for you. And it sounds, I mean, it's, it's part of what you do. So you're filling, that's, that's a corporate objective aside from the no, aside from the central business objective, yeah. Yes, so, yes. So, like I said, it's it's uh, digital. It's building digital skills for the SMEs because if you have all these infrastructures in place, we put the fiber, we rule out the fiber optic, and you're not able to use it to reach out to your potential cost, customers. There's no point. There's really nothing beneficial to you. So, what we tend to do is always try to assist the government in ways and partner with the government, we, can't, we understand we can't leave it all up to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so when you say it has to come from the top, so is, is it coming from the top in Nigeria? It's, it sounds like yeah, what Constance Yes, yes, says. there's more awareness. Yeah. There's actually so more how awareness. Do, how is it doing business with the government that's, that's yeah. you know, that's doing it from the top? The, the, there's more awareness now. The government on, understands that... Um, that digitization and connectivity is the new, well, let me just stop, let me just say something. You know, um, 
I don't know if you know this, but Nigeria has a dominant extractive industry. Over the years, that's what we had. Mm -hmm. So this is a new... So with the issue of oil, pri the, the drop in the oil price and everything, we're looking for ways to come up and do um, other... Uh, to build revenues through other, through other ways. So the government, there's, there's a common knowledge with the government now. They understand that <coughs> this is something we have to do, and they're always ready to partner. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Now, Frank, you have a, you have a, a different situation. You were telling me earlier about, um, about having all the alignment inside China for, for building DD, but uh, maybe you can tell us about that along with you know, how Didi evolved from a, a startup SME to where it is. And again, where's, where's the inclusion piece there? And where's the trade piece there, if you can bring us to those? Thank you. <coughs> uh, just as you mentioned, Didi is the fastest growing company in China. I want to say that if we uh, take note of the recent changes in the past five years and uh, look uh, uh, at the future, I do think that the platform, uh, the, the platform company and the new economy company and the sharing economy company will play a more and more important role and will become the driving force of the world economy. So why I say this, I do think that uh, the sharing economy is a new type of e-commerce because the traditional commerce and the trade is just the manufacture and sell the goods. But the e-commerce is to set up the platform to reduce the transaction cost, to uh, match the demand and the request and the supply. But the sharing economy is also same as this, but that's a new type of. We, we set up this platform to match the demand and the request and the supply to provide the, the servicing uh, the trading service so this is why so if we look at the world economy the top valuable company recently that is not traditional banks or chemical companies or oil companies that is the new economy companies in china that is tencent uh, and uh, and uh, and alibaba and uh, in the world side that will be google be facebook and uh, this is why dd can achieve so quick development in past years. I want to say that uh, through the platform, we can reduce the transaction cost. We can create the value for the world, <coughs> for the society. For example, as to DD, we already become the world's largest mobile transportation platform. We completed 20 million rides every day, which is two times as the rest of the world. We collected 400 million users and we collected 17.5 million drivers only in five years. We are also the world's biggest carpool platform and the world's biggest transportation debt platform. Why? I think maybe 10% 10, 10 of reason is due to the working hard by DD employees, but 90% is that we creating a new business model and creating the value for the society. In past five years, we changed the transportation habit of 1.3 billion Chinese people. Uh, five years ago, if you want to find a taxi, you have to wait in the street. A lot of uncertainty. You don't know how long you need to wait, but now you only need to wait at home or in office, press the app. Several minutes, a car will come to you. And we can also help the taxi drivers to reduce the cost, to increase their income. I want to say that uh, the digital economy, the e-commerce and the sharing economy will bring unprecedented opportunities for SMEs. Nothing is impossible if you embrace the change. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, Aretha mentioned a whole government approach. Does China have a whole government approach? What's, what has China done to enable growth of SMEs? How is it that you got to be, you know, from, from 150,000 to, to 50 billion? Yeah, yeah. What, is, what has China done? What's that enabling environment? I think that uh, just uh, one day ago, 
the CEO of Didi Chen Wei said that、uh, we are in the best time in China because why he said this? In the past five years, Chinese government attached greatest importance to the innovation and SMEs. The first thing is that as to the sharing economy, several months ago, Chinese government formulated the national guideline to support the sharing economy. I think this is the first country to support sharing economy to through the government specific action plan and guideline. Second, chi-、uh, uh, so back to DD. Second, China is the first country to formally legalize the right sharing industry in the world.、Uh, as to the new economy, the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang used to said, "Let the bullet fly for a while." Why he said this? When new things emerged, there are a lot of uncertainties. Nobody can look at very clearly its potential, its risk, its opportunities. So the government, the Chinese go- the Chinese government, wait and see to be an enabler for the new economy, for e-commerce and the sharing economy. The third, in past five years, Chinese government from the top level to local level, every level, every government, every official has some KPI to support the mass entrepreneur and the mass innovation. That is to encourage. The business development to support the SMEs and startups. The fourth is that in past five years, the Chinese government launched a great campaign to simplify the business procedures, to the regulatory procedures, to reduce the burden of the the SMEs and to reduce the tax. So. I do think that in China, the SMEs and the startups is in the best time. To do this, this is why DD can achieve so quick development. I want to repeat again: why DD can develop so quickly in the past five years? Maybe only ten percent is due to the working hard by our employees, <coughs> but we are in the best time and we have the best policy. That is very important. So I want to highlight the open and inclusive policy framework is critical for the development of、uh, SMEs and new economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to come back to the panel with a couple of things, which is,、um, so, what what does this mean for international trade policy? So some of you have touched on it, but you've talked about the domestic enabling environment quite a lot.、Um, so I want you to think about that for a second, and also think about whether you heard something from the other panelists. But all of you have been、um, here patiently for almost an hour, and I know that、um, I know that there are several people who I would consider experts in the audience. I'm not going to pick on you,、uh, but but please, if you have comments, what what should we you know what should we be collectively WTO global trade system? What should we be focusing on? What are the what are the big the big shots for SMEs、um, from your own point of view? Or of course, we're we're happy to take questions as well. But I'd lo- I'd love to hear from the audience. Is this are, is what you're hearing from the panel? Is that kind of encompassing the story? Do you think there's something else? So I give you an opportunity to pitch in. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Please introduce you. yourself as well. Thank you.、Okay. My name is Suleiman Audu from Nigeria. And、uh, I'm taking the floor largely to pay compliments、uh, to the distinguished panelists, and more importantly, from my compatriot、uh, <coughs> for the very eloquent and insightful presentation and sharing Nigeria's experience, which、uh, we are proud to listen to. In fact, this is the first time I'm listening to Constance making presentation, so I applaud you for that and your colleague as well.、Um, Well, I can't say more, more than what she has said from the government point of view.、Um, we, we take instruction from capital, so uh, uh, let me not go beyond what she has stated. But I just want to emphasize on couples of points,、uh, particularly just to recall what the minister said to reinforce our presentation、uh, during the e-commerce onward week, which we also participated in as friends of、uh, e-commerce for development, at least from WTO side. 
The minister said the smart Nigerian digital economy uh, is Nigerian response to an areas of, in, uh, of intense economic and technological activities of Nigerian youth uh, where there is growing pool of talent. And Nigerians are very offensive in this area because of the gains and development years are considerable. I think that still stands uh, uh, to, to, to the, but more importantly, uh, there was also the target mentioned in terms of the Nigerian digital economy uh, to generate $88 billion, uh, create 3 million jobs over the next 10 years. I just want to, I'll limit myself to that. But let me also say from the point of view of the business, I also listen to the business and I'll tell you precisely what the International Chamber of Commerce said of recent during the dialogue with the WTO in terms of how to interact and see how the WTO rules will help and respond to uh, the interests of the business community. Uh, they said the following, just quick three points, that according to the studies, uh, that the studies shows that mismis that use online platforms are around five times more likely to export than those in the traditional economy, number one. Number two, they also refer to the Empirica research that also finds that companies that are connected to the global economy are more productive and contribute to the development of more prosperous communities, number two. And number three, they said today's trade rules, uh, which largely reflect 20th century patterns of trees, are not always well suited uh, to supporting the growth of Miss Miss e-commerce. That is what the business said. Uh, maybe I'll conclude by saying that I don't want to say much about the negotiating point of view but I will tell you that we have the war program that was launched in 1988. Uh, since that period, there have been progressively uh, ministerial decisions on e-commerce, which you follow through in terms of reinfigurations of work and what can be done to also support work in that area. But the linkage between <coughs> e-commerce uh, and mismis is just coming out prominently now, because in the W2, there's no structural way of discussing mismis except in the context of this trade and development and the challenges faced by MISMI. So we are now seeing the interaction and the linkage between one, e-commerce, two, uh, trade facilitation, three, investment facilitations, and the MISMIs, including the challenges and opportunity that they are facing. I think the last one to say now is that what kind of rules or engagement do you think the WTO need to do or any other international organization of that nature? to support uh, the mismis, particularly in terms of participating in the global market. But there's also another issue that we need to also look at. One is the domestic market, which is being talked about, but the cross-border aspect will also need to be looked at in terms of these international rules and cooperation that will facilitate the participation of mismis uh, in the global economy. I think I'll limit it to that, but I don't have any question for, for the panel, but rather than just a big compliment, and I thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, sir, in the back of the room. Uh, thank you. Thank you, moderator. And uh, I would like to also thank uh, the panelists who have made their presentations. Uh, however, uh, uh, since uh, my brother from uh, Nigeria has uh, just highlighted a few points, uh, from my perspective, I don't think there is any denial that uh, there is a linkage between e-commerce and SMEs. However, what is not clear is if there is a linkage between the proposed, the digital trade rule proposed here at the WTO with growth of SMEs. Because I believe that this is what we are uh, here to discuss. Uh, that's what we are here to, to talk about. So in a way, I believe every country, even, the, even in the African group, which is kind of perceived as if it is not pro-e-commerce, uh, we are all uh, in one direction working for, uh, wishing to, 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 to grow our e-commerce. Uh, in our countries. However, like I said before, what, we, what is not clear is the linkage between the, 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 the trade, the economy, the, the trade rules that are being proposed uh, with SMEs growth. 
For instance, how is uh, uh, free uh, free flow free flow of of data uh, related to, to 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 SME growth? How is a uh, security issues uh, in e-commerce related to SME growth. How is uh, um, uh, the data localization, data localization prohibition related uh, to, to SMEs? All those filters, because we, we need to unpack uh, those, uh, those, 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 those uh, issues. Uh, for instance, my sister, uh, uh, Constance from Nigeria mentioned that uh, there is this, this concern in Nigeria that uh, if the CFTA uh, is concluded, what will happen thereafter? There could be a, a dumping of products into Nigeria. My question is to, to my sister and to everybody in the panel is, would you rather have the whole world dumping into Nigeria than Africa? Because it's, it's, it's more or less uh, the same. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, could you please just identify yourself, sir? Uh, your, your name? I'm Sandile from the Swazi Mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments or interventions? Because I think of our colleague, yes, uh, Lee. Hi, yeah, Lee, Lee Tuthill. I, I work on e-commerce at the WTO. Um, I think that two comments and questions that came before me were some of the th same kinds of things on my mind. And I think that it, for me it's interesting to think of an example where the WTO's area is really for the cross-border trade and what governments do that might encourage and perhaps not block cross-border trade. Um, and that has a backwards effect, I think, on, on a regulatory regime that would also perhaps enable uh, domestic trade. And when I think about examples of where the WTO might kick in, I think, for example, of uh, the market platforms that are being evolving for SMEs in particular. And I would wonder if you see, for example, platforms like uh, the one you're setting up, Rupa, as anticipating having some of the kinds of problems that governments might be doing things that, because they're not comfortable with these kind of platforms or, you know, they requiring might require you to set up a, a data center in a country where you couldn't afford to do it. I think that's some of the intersection between some of the things we're thinking about. And frankly, f from our trade and services agreement, we're not even sure where these platforms fit into our system, for example. Yeah, and let's, let's actually, let's just come back to the panel because our, our colleague from Swaziland also raised some, um, some issues that I would like to hear from all of you. But uh, let's start with you, Rupa. You and I were talking about a number of things yeah. just, just in that area. And I'd like to hear from the rest mm -hmm. of you, too, about you know, how you see the linkage between SMEs and, and some of these things. It might be data flows, localization, um, but there are other things, too, like yeah. you and I discussed. So. So I think actually, um, you know, since we're involved in really importing, exporting and doing all of that stuff, we're incurring a lot of new issues which haven't been dealt with in the past. So some of the things, I'll just raise a few sort of points, um, as you mentioned as well about the WTO. And I, I don't have an answer to where it fits in, and I think that's a discussion over time. I think it will, will come together. But some of the areas that we have issues, for example, invoicing is a problem. Um, you know, what kind of invoicing do you do? There's, there's, there's um, um, you know, regulations around uh, digital um, electronic signatures and things like that. Uh, the ability to acquire mobile payments or the, the ability to make internet payments. So, for instance, if I have a supplier, I'll give you a, an illustrated case. So, if I have a supplier in, uh, let's say, Ethiopia, which I do, um, I can't actually pay her using the majority of um, you know, established um, online portals like PayPal or any of those systems because it's not possible for me to do that because of their local um, national laws. Now, if there is a prioritization for SMEs to be able to access you know, international markets and if e-commerce is indeed one of the priorities, then I think one needs to discuss how those are going to change because let's face it, you're not going to take you know, a suitcase of money and travel around the world. It just doesn't work like that. So if, if, if you're going to really be realistic about this and move from theory to practical stuff, then I think you've got to think about implementation and figure out 
what are the areas and how are you going to really make that money reach the person's hands without you know her or or him having to pay ridiculous percentages because if they're going to pay 30% or 40% to require you know to get that money that that business is of no use to them so that's their profit margin gone so you know that's a very very real issue in in the way of being able to be a part of the global e-commerce marketplace you have to be able to get paid and if you can't get paid you can't be a part of the system that's one thing a second thing is you know i'm not sure if you're aware of the term called drop shipment is anyone aware of the term drop shipment no yes Okay, someone, okay. So I'll just sort of very basic, very simply I'll put, it's basically, now let's say I'm a platform, right? I'm enabling the transaction to take place between you as a consumer and you as a supplier, right? So now you have placed the order on my platform and you're the supplier who has to actually get that payment and fulfill the order. Fulfilling an order basically means shipping that order to the person. Now that different ways of doing this business. The traditional model is a wholesale model where I as a platform actually buy your products at a certain <coughs> price and sell the products to you. This is the most sort of conventional form of trade. Then there's a model of consignment where I could hold your products without actually buying your products, which has its own constraints, but anyway, won't go there. Um, and then I ship it to you and I settle with you, but I'm still the sort of middle person. The third model, which is becoming more and more relevant in the e-commerce space, is drop shipment, which essentially means I reduce my risk, I don't hold your goods at all, you get a higher commission, you get a higher price because I'm not taking on that risk, you ship directly to him. But to do that, you should be able to do that. It's the same concept of technical assistance and capacity building. If you don't have the skills to do that, you can't do that, which means you've got to use me to do it, which means you get a lower percentage of the profit, I take some money from you because, hey, I'm doing some work here, but I take on the risk. So essentially, it's much easier for me if I can have a lot of people on my platform who I can do drop shipment with because I reduce my risk and you get a better margin on profits. So if SMEs are going to actually get more money in their hands, they've got to get these new skill sets which need or which, are, which, you know, which, which require them to, to do different things that were not required in the past. So that's another, just a simple, you know, and that again goes down to capacity building, technical assistance, but also certain policies. Now, the third thing I want to talk about is um, the way customs regulations work. And this has actually been a very recent issue for me, where my shipment, in spite of me, which I'd like to believe knows something about trade rules, um, I had my consignment blocked for 48 hours in, a, in an airport not very far away in Europe. I won't sort of discuss very further where that was, but a, you know, very established, um, you know, um, system. So we're not talking about someone not knowing the rules. Um, anyhow, so the products were coming from a country, uh, in a, from a developing country where this country had a duty-free agreement with the EU. And uh, the particular agreement had not been used substantially, let's say. So it wasn't exactly a common used agreement, but we did use it and it was absolutely legal for the rules of origin and the papers required. Anyhow, all the paperwork was done. It arrived at this particular airport and then the products were kept for 48 hours. Why? Not because the paperwork wasn't right, because the customs officials and the people weren't aware of these rules and they didn't know about this agreement. Therefore, they wouldn't clear the goods duty free. They were like, no, you have to pay the duty. I said, no, I don't have to pay the duty. Here are the documents. So they actually needed 48 hours to discuss that and agree on it and then just, yes, and then, of course, clear the goods. But imagine 48 hours, unfortunately, is a very long time in e-commerce, right? Imagine if you had placed an order and I'm going to give you next day delivery and my products are stuck at, you know, at an airport for 48 hours, there goes my reputation and I'm supposed to have to now refund money to you and, you know, all of that. So I think... When it comes to trade facilitation, it's not just about developing countries. I think it's generally because e-commerce is a new thing. I think this is something that needs to be taken up as a separate type of trade facilitation, capacity building across the world where e-commerce is a priority. So those are just a couple of areas, and I could honestly go on. There's just so many different areas in which policy could you know, play a, a certain role. Just maybe one more area I would probably say, uh, which is really important, is the ethics around trade. And it's a bit of a soft issue because it's not necessarily very tangible. One could just, you know, you could all define ethics in a very different way. But, you know, we all know that there's a lot of um, unethical trading happening across the world. And if we have to sort of move into an era where we're, we're all consciously aware of doing ethical trading, I think there needs to be something around how we protect 
privacy, protect data, prote you know, literally comes down to data protection. How do we protect people's information? How do we not expose people or, or vulnerable people from, um, I don't know, all kinds of different things? So I think with the opening of e-commerce, these are new issues that become very real for literally every person on the street. So I think those are things that one needs to think about in terms of data protection while not uh, becoming a barrier to actually doing efficient trade. Thanks. Um, very good. I'd like to also ask some of our, our other panelists if they'd like to address either of these questions. I would also be interested in hearing you take up our colleague from Swaziland. So um, as far as I know, the f free data flows and data localization aren't yet part of the discussion here, but they are part of the global discussion. So I'm curious how, um, how your governments have responded. But I see one more question from the floor, so I'd like to, I'd like to keep the floor open as well. So let me come back to the panel, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm I'm come from the WTI Institute, uh, WTI from the University of Bern. I got a question for uh, for Mr. Frank Wang Pang. Um, actually, you mentioned the in China it's very important to have WeChat, have DD uh, to know to know the WeChat DD and other softwares to make the e-commerce our e-commerce uh, more visible. I'd like to know. Um, would you please uh, provide further information? How to help how a European company who would like to make the products or the, their services more visible in China? What what do you propose them to do to make them more vi invisible in Chinese market and uh, to tailor their service and products according to the Chinese um, customers and and Chinese uh, consuming habits? Thank you very much. Thank you. And let me let me take one more from the floor and then come back to the panel. Um, Felipe Sandoval. Thank you, Andrew. But as I know, I mean, as you probably know, more than questions have comments. Um, I'm Felipe Sandoval, and I work with ICTSZ, uh, and we spend you know, a lot of time, Andrew and I, um, uh, working around these issues of e-trade and services and, and many others. And and one thing that I that I've seen or heard, and I think that it's, it, it's, it's very important, is that all of the issues that have been mentioned, telecommunications, transport services, distribution services, privacy, um, e-signatures, authentication, data flows, they all fall within the realm of the WTO. And there's a mandate which is explicit which has been there for 20-something years, asking for members to negotiate and develop new rules on these issues. And what the WTO is doing now, or trying to do now, on the realm of digital trade, e-commerce or digital commerce, whatever you want to call it, is basically trying to catch up to reality. Business, it's already gone its own way. And in doing so, it's encountered a number of difficulties and barriers, but it doesn't have the time for you no know, uh, standing on the sidelines and wait for governments to solve issues. Somehow, in order to make the business work, they need to find a way around problems. And governments are now here and outside the WTO trying to catch up. Um, also, I just wanted to uh, uh, you know, uh, really highlight the fact that this this panel has been positive. It's all about you know, success stories. Um, it's all about developing country and SME's involvement in global value chains through digital trade. Um, so I think that there is a case, a very strong case, for the WTO and the community outside the WTO to work around rules that first lock in the progress already achieved by the trade community and the business community outside the WTO, and two, make sure that that progress can be projected into the future. And three, that in doing so, we'll do it in a way that allows not only big players to benefit, but also players from areas of the world, such as Africa, but not just Africa, to benefit from it. Good, thank you. Yes, Colette, please. 
Um, thank you. I'm Colette Vanerven from Sydney, Austin. Um, I just wanted to add to what Philippe was saying, and I think while it's important to work on strengthening the multilateral system on e-commerce and the regulations, um, there's also a role to be played on the implementation phase. In other words, um, how can we as trade lawyers, for my, speaking for myself, but others as well, operating in this field, help businesses like Spina and others to actually navigate these complex trade rules as they are um, engaging in e-commerce. And this problem is a little bit more complicated when SMEs are engaged in e-commerce than SMEs that are not, because typically they target more markets. Um, and that means they will have to comply with an additional set of regulatory barriers, food loss, if you are dealing with food products, um, standard issues, as Rupa mentioned, for for garments, uh, and you have, in addition to tradi traditional trade barriers, the digital issues, right, such as privacy agreements, consumer protection, etc. Um, so it's extremely complicated for small businesses to navigate this, and um, a lot of the the, the problems or, or barriers are also within on the ground within that sphere. So I think sometimes um, it, it may be a good idea as well to spend some of our resources on how we can utilize the trade system um, to help SMEs better benefit, um, to not just look at it from a top down, but also from a bottom up. Um, and in this context, um, we're lucky at Sidley, we have a, a pro bono program and we're lucky to have Rupa as our client actually. So um, although we haven't actually uh, have to give her a lot of advice on the trade rules because she already knows those very well. Um, <laughs> but um, through the confines of those types of programs, I think it's uh, something not to, uh, not, not to forget when we have this debate. Thanks. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to follow on from what Felipe was saying about the mandate at the WTO to negotiate new rules on e-commerce because when I actually read the 1998 uh, decision and declaration actually on e-commerce as a trade lawyer, to me it doesn't say a mandate to negotiate new rules. It says to examine all trade-related issues relating to e-commerce. So that has been a mandate to discuss but not to negotiate new rules. And if you remember in the Nairobi ministerial, it said that there had to be explicit consensus and so on for new issues like e-commerce. And when we look at the actual e-commerce proposals that have been made in the WTO, especially the batch from last year uh, by the EU, US and Japan, they are proposing TRIPS plus trade secrets protection, TRIMS plus total ban on technology transfer, total liberalization of government procurement, technical barriers to trade plus new rules. And so there are obviously no mandates to negotiate investment in the WTO, that, in the Doha round, that's a Singapore issue, to negotiate TRIPS Plus, to negotiate government procurement, another Singapore issue that's been kicked out of the Doha round. So I'm not clear where is the mandate to negotiate new rules, especially those that have been uh, proposed on e-commerce, because I, I don't see it as a trade lawyer in the legal text. And then the question is, well, if we don't have new rules on e-commerce in the WTO, what happens? Does it all stop tomorrow when we all go offline again? The answer is we continue. As today, I think it's 25 trillion US dollars a year in e-commerce is happening without the WTO having any new rules. We hear Spinner is selling things already. So uh, it, this is the, the situation that we're uh, facing at the WTO at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Would, I'm sorry, would you just please oh, identify yeah. yourself as well? Thanks. Sorry, I forgot. Sanya Reed-Smith from Third World Network. Thank you very much. Um, so let me... Would, uh, let me come back to our panel, and I, because we have just a few minutes left, and if we have time for additional questions coming in, we'll do that. But we have one specifically uh, that came for Frank, and, and I still don't want to forget the question from our colleague from Swaziland, which I think is an important one. Maybe I could reframe it in a way, which is how are your, you know, how are your governments or how are your institutions thinking about these big issues? Even if we don't anticipate that they'll be negotiated here, they will and are being negotiated elsewhere. So let me pass it back to you, Frank, and then maybe I go to Constance, Aretha, and come back to Rupa. Okay, if I understand correctly that you ask me uh, how the European company can achieve a success in China, uh, very frankly, in e-commerce, yeah. Uh, I do think that because I have uh, multiple background, I used to work in the Chinese government. I used to work in the top multinational companies. I now I work in the Chinese local company. I uh, maybe not only in the area of e-commerce, but also in the other area. I want to say that win-win relationship is very very important. How to build this win-win relationship? I I always ask me this question because I uh, for DD we are, we become more and more global. 
how can we achieve success in other market? The solution is that to build the partnership with local peer companies. I want to say, uh, in Brazil, in Brazil we we do not just set the just set up one subsidiary there. We work with the local leading peers, local leading peers ninety nine, and we provide the the investment. We provide our technology and the management skill and the, to help the local partners. We build the local win-win ecosystem. I also just want to respond to the question proposed by African friends. I, uh, when I engaged into the trade negotiations, my African friends told me that they have concern. Once they open the market, maybe their market will be overtaken by foreign company. I do want to say that uh, the cooperation approach is very, very important, instead of only just the competition. I also want to highlight the other point is localize. If you just want to set up one subsidiary in China or in other market and compete with the local companies, that will be very, very difficult to success because any market has its unique situation. Your product should be localized and you need to set up localized <coughs> partnership to support your business. And basically, I also think that your leadership should also be localized. The local people will know, know more about the local situation. The first is that you need to reduce the decision chain. If every decision will be made by head, the headquarters, that will be very difficult. So my solution is to win-win relationship, localize. Good, thank you. Constance. Yes. Um, okay, um, in, in response to the gentleman from uh, Swaziland, um, I think that um, in our country, one of the things that the government has done is to set up the Nigerian Office for Trade Negotiations. And the reason why we did this was that um, with the crash in oil prices from over 100 uh, dollar peak to less than 50. Um, we, we, we knew that we had to diversify the sources of our revenue. So this office is dedicated to dealing with issues such as this. I'm not a negotiator or a technical person. But here in the office, it's going to be dealing with all issues, whether from e-commerce, digital economy, um, agriculture, services, across board. And so um, if you want more information, we can talk after this. But uh, the point is that we realize that um, we definitely need to do something about this, and we are doing that. On the dumping issue, I think that a lot of the fears are because of lack of information or misinformation. But it's obvious that <coughs> African countries have to really um, do structural reforms from their countries, nationally first of all, and then go regionally, and then uh, continent-wide. And we are doing that in Nigeria, and it is part of the discussion that we are having at the CFTA. Why is it that we trade more with Europe than amongst ourselves? I mean, it doesn't make sense. You know, it does not make sense. In ECOWAS, for instance, Nigeria is more than 50% of the market, and yet most of the countries trade with Europe. So these are some of the issues that we know that we have to deal with. And then when we're able to work through them, we create jobs for our people, uh, which I think you know, is, is one of the, um, the major goals um, at the end of the day. So I don't know if this answers your questions, but we don't have time. So I'm happy to talk to you after this. Thank you, Constance. Mm -hmm. Quick word from you, Aretha, on uh, either of those. Okay. Um, Philippi mentioned something, if I'm correct, about um, it's more about the e-commerce agenda. Is that it? Am I correct? Yeah, he was about the e-commerce <coughs> mandate. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, about the e-commerce okay. Okay. program, actually. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I just want to talk about um, the relevance, basically, of the e-commerce agenda or digital economy agenda that is um, to Huawei as a company and um, to developing countries as well. So um, let me just um, say that um, we have seen a couple of uh, negotiating outcomes that have come out of the e-commerce chapters and the TBT chapters of the TPP which um, to me seemed like a good landing zone for multilateral disciplines. In terms of um, relevancy to a developing country, I believe this 
agenda can uh, build a framework for which developing countries can bridge the digital divide. That is, if they take, if they take advantage of the divide, they will be able to have a fuller participation in the digital economy. And um, for a telecommunication company like Huawei, uh, let me say that Huawei is a major provider for telecom equipment, a major provider for a major manufacturer for smartphones, um, tablets, and other wearables, as well as uh, a leader in cloudification of telecommunication networks. So we would like the WTO to update the set of rules they have in, they already have in place because this is the only way we can continue to have relevance in this um, digital era. I understand that most of this, most of these rules are not, yes, like someone earlier mentioned, they are not um, only trade issues, they are financial issues, development issues, investment issues as well. So this is outside the remit of the WTO. So I, get, I believe in order to get a permanent solution to this, we will need um, a full cooperation and input from the UNCTAD, uh, World Bank, the, um, donors, developing countries as well, the business um, community, as well as the um, civil society as well, in order to have a robust set of policies that can help us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. We're coming to a close. Rupa says five seconds, ten seconds. Literally five seconds. I think on all the things that there have been challenges, I am also uh, really delighted in the last couple of days to have seen the level of collaboration and cooperation and the sort of intent that I found amongst um, donor agencies, literally to, to sort of, uh, sort of you know, uh, back up what Aretha says, as well as international organizations. And I think it's brilliant to see that people are aligning their activities and agendas. Um, I'm sure there's always going to be things that still need to be done, but but, you know, hey, we've got to start one step at a time. So I'm really, really happy to see that intent. And I'd love to be part of that process. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We're coming to a close. Uh, thanks to all of you, uh, to the ICTS team, team who helped support us, the interpreters who've been patient and consistent, um, and to all of our panel. So please give them a hand. And thank you very much. You all have feedback forms on your tables, so we'd really appreciate it if you take a minute uh, here or outside to fill them in and send them or give them back to us. Thank you very much. Thank you.